Welcome to the Who's Left podcast, a show about Indiana politics, history, and culture from the unapologetic perspective of the Hoosier left. My name is Scott Aaron Rogers, and I'm recording from Bloomington. So a few months ago, I was honored to host activist, author, and former chair of the State Democratic Party in Ohio, David Pepper, on this podcast. In his 2021 book, Laboratories of Autocracy, and its 2023 sequel, Saving Democracy, one of the Republican dirty tricks he highlights is extreme gerrymandering. In captured red states, GOP legislatures have abused their power to redraw district lines in such a way as to ensure themselves a majority in the state house, and that most races will be entirely uncompetitive. Thus begins a vicious cycle of extremism in which legislators face no accountability, have no incentive to compromise, and must be as partisan as possible in order to fend off opponents in the primary, the only time they might really be challenged. Public outcomes suffer, and donors run the show. Since the critical election of 2010, Indiana Republicans have run this same playbook in the Hoosier State, holding a supermajority of more than two-thirds of both houses in the Assembly the entire time, currently controlling 70% of House seats and a whopping 80% in the Senate. True to form, Indiana Republicans have taken the state down an extreme path, crusading against LGBTQ Hoosiers, enacting one of the most restrictive abortion bans in the country, and defunding public education to funnel public money to unaccountable private and religious schools. Just some of the most heinous legislation passed in recent sessions. Given the immoderate gerrymandering, Hoosier Democrats do not have a realistic chance of flipping the State House this year. But Jennifer McCormick is within striking distance of the governor's office, Destiny Wells is on Todd Rokita's heels, and the party has set the entirely achievable goal of flipping the four seats it will take to break the supermajority and hopefully force the Republicans to moderate. And no single House seat is more flippable than my own District 62. Just two years ago, Republican Dave Hall defeated friend of the pod Penny Givens by a mere 74 votes, the closest race in the state. In 2024, Hall's Democratic challenger is Thomas Horrocks, a pastor, chaplain in the Army National Guard, and my guest today. This is Horrocks' second appearance on the show. We first spoke in December of last year. That was before the campaign really got underway, and a whole lot has happened since. In this conversation, we'll talk about the economy, culture wars, religious nationalism, public education, the environment, and standing up to big money. Before we turn to the interview, please consider supporting Who's Left with a paid subscription. I currently work as an independent craftsman during the day and work on this project whenever I can. There are so many more things I want to do here at Who's Left. More campaign finance research, more live hangouts, a daily episode if we can get there. But I need your help. If you can, visit scottaaronrogers.substack.com and subscribe at the paid level. $5 a month or $50 a year, you can help me push our state in a better direction, and maybe, if we reach critical mass, I can put down my tool belt and devote my full time to you, to this project, and to Indiana's future. So, if you have the means... Pause right now, go to scottaaronrogers.substack.com, and subscribe at the paid level. And while the best way to help this project is financially, if that doesn't work for your budget at this time, you can still help. Subscribe at the free level over on Substack. Set your favorite podcast player to auto-download new episodes of the show. 
rate, and review the show on whatever platform you use. This trains the algorithm to help new people find us. Follow me on social media at Facebook, Blue Sky, YouTube, and TikTok at Who's Left, that's H-O-O-S Left. On Instagram, Threads, and Twitter, I am at ScottRaj78, S-C-O-T-T-R-O-G-7-8. And on Mastodon at ScottRoger78 at Hoosier.social. Please subscribe on whichever platforms you use and send me a DM to discuss ideas for the project. But most importantly, spread the word. Forward the articles to friends, family, and colleagues. Don't just like, but share on social media. Invite others to our little corner of the Indiana. And I might be the guy with the microphone, but I try to take this thing where your input leads me. So please, be generous with feedback. Good, bad, or meh. I value it all. To those who have joined this community already, especially those paid subscribers, thank you for believing in me. And to everybody, thanks for listening. And here's my interview with Thomas Horrocks. Thomas Horrocks, welcome back to the Who's Left podcast. Thank you. It's good to be back with you. Has it been a full year yet, or are we not quite there? Not quite. I believe it was uh, December last year. Okay. Okay. Feels like a lot has happened since then. Uh, indeed. Indeed. It has been uh, quite a year. So um, at that time when we last talked, you know, the, the, the campaign was sort of just getting underway uh, you know, you hadn't really been out talking to a lot of constituents and doing any canvassing yet, right? The weather was still crappy. It was, you know, the election was almost a year away at that point. But now that you've been out there, um, I assume there, there's a lot that folks are talking about. There is. There is indeed. Um, you know, we've been at doors all over the district from the most rural parts of Monroe and Brown County to the uh, Bloomington suburbs and and people have lots of feelings and opinions. They're they're feeling the weight of economic pressures. They're feeling concerns about uh, an increasingly extreme the supermajority and what that might mean for them or their their children or their grandchildren. Um, so yeah, and then obviously with the the change at the top of the ticket, uh, you know, we, there's renewed energy and excitement uh, here in the county and the district. Um, so it's a it's an exciting time. Was that um, change at the top of the ticket like like really palpable? Like there was an energy change. You were out canvassing, talking to people, say you know until the end of June or even after that debate. Oh my God, just the mood was like panic. I think after that first debate, and and then uh, when uh, Kamala took over the top of the ticket. You'd say that that just changed the energy in, in, entirely with people you're talking to? Yes, entirely, um, especially with regards to sort of our um, more liberal base around Bloomington. I think there was just a lot of disenfranchisement with Biden. There was a lot of malaise. Uh, I was talking with people who were saying they, they weren't even going to vote this year because they were just, you know, so we were we were strategizing at one point. What do we do? to encourage people to get out to at least vote down ticket um, if they're not going to vote for the top. And since the since Harris became the nominee, um, it's just been totally different. We don't feel like we have to do that anymore. And as a matter of fact, we have volunteers coming into the office every day, uh, new people who are looking for signs and looking to get involved. And um, they'll end up volunteering for you know my race or another down ticket race. So it has been a, a remarkably palpable energy shift uh, in a very exciting and encouraging way. Well, that's really encouraging. Uh, and, and does that translate out into Brown County and the more uh, rural areas in, in the district? I haven't felt it as much out in the more rural areas of the district, although as I drive around, I'm seeing Harris signs in places that you wouldn't necessarily expect um, in some of the rural areas. And so I think it is translating, um, but I'm not hearing that as much at the doors. Um, I would say though like in in the national area which is a little bit more um you know uh, liberal were there's definitely some excitement there well that's that's good to hear that's 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 really encouraging 
Um, but as, as as we know, you know, stuff at the national level might drive excitement and it gets all the attention. But the stuff here down ballot, especially you know, in the state house, that's where the policy that really affects our day to day lives is made. Um, you talked about the extremism of the supermajority. Yeah. Are people feeling that as you talk to them? Do, do they realize what's going on there? Because it doesn't get as much attention. Um, yes and no. Some people do, right? Um, and they're a little bit easier to mobilize. Others, it's more education. It's more letting them know, um, hey, here's what the, the supermajority has done, has been doing, and is planning on doing in the next year. And when we have those conversations, they're sort of like, oh, uh, even among Republicans. And I, I may have told you the last time we met, but I've had several Republicans throughout the course of this who have said, uh, listen, I, I'm a Republican, but I recognize that a supermajority that has uh, no accountability, that can make decisions in caucus behind closed doors, isn't good for anybody. Um, as a matter of fact, just uh, within the last two weeks, I had an event sponsored by ReCenter Indiana, which is a bipartisan mm -hmm. uh, coalition made up of Republicans, independents, and Democrats. Um, and their main focus this year is breaking the supermajority because they all realize uh, that that extremism and that accountability is deeply out of touch with the values and the needs, uh, not just of Democrats in the state, but really of, of everybody in the state. And that th these policies that have been coming forward in the past you know, decade or so um, are hurting, they're really hurting everybody, uh, economically, socially, uh, the human and, and economic impact of these policies is is hard to ignore um unless you are on the the most extreme right yeah do, do, are, are folks making that connection then so they 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 realize that hey um these guys in indiana that don't have any accountability these republicans do whatever they want um that's translating to folks' bottom line. We're we're definitely trying to make that connection for them uh, when we talk to them, and so things I'll say at the door is, you know, hey, I'm I'm running because I think that our state government ought to focus more on everyday uh, regular Hoosiers instead of corporate interests and culture wars. And when I say that, sort of across the board, we're like, well, yeah, I, I mean, I can get behind that. Um, and then if we have the time, we'll explain. Okay, well, here's here's how this is affecting you, and I'll talk about things like. Um, you know, the how the extreme policies are driving our college graduates uh, out of state and then the economic impact that that has and our inability to attract uh, the kinds of businesses that need an educated workforce that can pay um, better wages for folks. And then, um, the, you know, then we can have more revenue in the state and it becomes less burdensome on everybody. Um, and so when we when I have enough time to make those connections, people sort of see that they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I see why that uh, is an important change to make is the kitchen table stuff economy uh, you know housing wages health care is is that what people want to talk about most when when they talk to you i'd say 95 percent of the time yes um you know, property taxes has been number one uh especially out in the rural areas with uh like retired folks on fixed incomes uh, who saw the value of their house, you know, sort of explode over the last few years, but they have no intention of moving or selling. So all the only effect that has on them is they're paying higher property taxes. And now they have to make sometimes very difficult decisions between, you know, um, do they stay in their house? Do they do they buy medicine or food? Right. Like real stories that I've heard from people who are trying to make these decisions. Um uh, among teachers, obviously, right, we're we're experiencing uh, some real concern that they're going to lose even more of their ability to collectively bargain in the next budget cycle. Um, we're hearing from folks uh, who have medically complex situations uh, with Medicaid, both on the on the children end and on the senior end, who are now uh, scrambling because of this one billion dollar Medicaid shortfall that came after the last budget cycle. Um, so medically complex children are losing. Um, you know, some of the care they had access to from their parents and then seniors with with the new um, pathways program are finding themselves having to re-enroll and, and not understanding the bureaucratic steps they have to to go through. And so they're losing care and losing coverage. 
um, which is having real economic impact on their ability to just live. So yeah, I would say the economic impact of these policies has been the number one issue, whether it's property tax or Medicaid or utility prices, um, wages. So that culture war stuff, which which seems to be the Republican focus, and, and, and therefore we have to spend all our time answering to it, uh, that doesn't really resonate with people. It, it's certainly not their top issue, right? It, at least when I at least when I knock on their door and I say, you know, what are you most concerned about? Ninety five percent of the time, it's economic. Um, you know, I have had a handful of doors. Um, where culture war stuff comes up with the exception of there are lots of women who are very concerned about Indiana's abortion ban um, and the effect that that's having, you know, so their concerns for themselves or their children or their grandchildren, um, that, that really does seem to have a lot of uh, folks, men and women actually, um, in in the district, pretty concerned. Uh, and that, that does seem to be a few folks' top issue, especially on... Um, the more democratic side. Sure. And, and and obviously that's an intensely intimate and personal issue, but it is also a kitchen table economic issue. I mean, exactly right. you know, fa family planning is, is, is incredibly important for, for, you know, you, your, your life cycle and, and your, your economic prospects and, 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 and everything, right? I, absolutely. Absolutely. And even on top of that, right? So we talk about the downriver effects of bad policy. Um, Twenty-five percent of the counties in Indiana are maternal care deserts right now, which means that even women who want to have children, right, have uh, in twenty-five percent of our counties have to travel to another county to get maternity care. Um, we uh, we're losing OBGYN residents who are telling us they don't want to come to Indiana to practice because they're afraid of what you know. Uh, practicing under these extreme laws and the human cost of that, right? We know that uh, just a year ago, there was a woman uh, who lived in one of these maternal care deserts. She was suffering from an ectopic pregnancy. She had to drive to another county to get care, and she ended up dying because she couldn't get the care she needed in a timely fashion. Um, and so I even beyond family planning, right, we're, we're seeing the real human cost of, of these extreme um, policies and culture wars that are having real effects on on people's everyday lives, and the the, the maternal care desert, the the lack of OBGYNs from you know because of the abortion ban, the culture war stuff. Right. Um, but then also that it goes in hands in hand. It's like the you know the middle of the Venn diagram between culture war issues and economic issues because right. um, our our, our health care policy in the state has. Well, you know, even nationally has has led to uh, hospital consolidation, and they they close the little rural hospitals, and they make everybody you know drive to to, to the bigger cities to receive necessary care, and it, it's getting you from both sides, right? Yeah, I, that's exactly right. A and so here's an area where you know typically Republicans have claimed to have the, the the best interests of rural folks at heart, but these policies are leaving rural Hoosiers behind uh, in terms of health care, uh, in terms of broadband, in terms of infrastructure. We, we just learned that um, we're about a, a billion dollars short on our needed road funding to, to just keep our roads up, and that's going to disproportionately affect rural communities as well. Um, so one of the things that I'm, I've been talking a lot about is the the real human and economic costs of culture wars, right? That in focusing so much on these extreme culture wars, it, it is leaving us behind economically. It's having real human costs. Um, it's, you know, uh, Michael Hicks had a, a great article recently mm. uh, about how in the last 20 years, um, Indiana has fallen 14% uh, in real wages while the rest of the country has risen about 1%, right? Um, and all of this has happened while we've gone after uh, unions and attacked right to work and, and undercut the ability of people to collectively bargain. Um, so once again, it, leaving regular working everyday Hoosiers behind um, all because they're, they're so focused on, on the, the kinds of culture war things that help them win the primaries. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, yeah, it is my contention that the the culture war issues are are there specifically to distract from the crappy economic policy. That I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite cartoons, uh, political cartoons, and I, I've showed it in my church and other places. Um, there's sort of, like there's this uh, elderly businessman, you know, wearing a suit with a plate full of cookies in front of him. Uh, there's this this young construction worker with a plate uh, with one cookie in front of him, and then there's uh, what's clearly an immigrant uh, with no cookies in front of him. And this elderly business guy um, says to the construction worker, "Watch out, fella! That foreigner wants to take your cookie, right?" Um, and I think we could replace the foreigner with um, you know a trans person, an LGBTQ person, you know anything like that. All of these things are becoming scapegoats and distractions so that they can continue to protect uh, corporate profits. Uh, and and then the rest of us are sort of left in the dust. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and the, and the, the, the tension, I think, is, is manufactured because in the last, say, 30 years, um, the LGBTQ community has made tremendous strides in terms of you know, cultural acceptance and gaining human rights and whatnot, right? And and a, a lot of other folks have been left behind economically. So they, you know, they see themselves falling behind and this other group who they're already, they already have a predilection to dislike for whatever reason. They see, they see them moving ahead relative to where they were anyway. And... It, I could see how they could think, you know, we're getting shafted while this other speed. Correct. And it's a tale as old as time, right? This uh, spinning up identity politics in a divisive way to prevent class solidarity. Well, I mean, we saw that immediately coming out of the Civil War, right? Where there was the fear that, um, you know, poor freed slaves, poor blacks and poor whites were going to unite in a class solidarity and realize that they were all sort of um, under the thumb. And so what did they do? They, they manufactured this idea of, you know, white supremacy to separate uh, the, the poor whites from the poor blacks and scapegoat then uh, the blacks with racism to prevent uh, class solidarity. Um, it, it happened and it's happened all the way since and, and the groups change, right? Um, perhaps it's people of color, perhaps it's immigrants, perhaps it's LGBTQ folks. Um, but some vulnerable group becomes the scapegoat then to prevent all of us who are experiencing economic pressure from uniting together and say, we, we deserve better. And so I think it, that's just where we have to recognize the, the game that's being played. Uh, we have to reject it out of hand and understand that really it's, it's not, you know, um, immigrants versus natives it's not lgbtq folks versus straight people um really we have a rich and powerful few who are trying to stir all of us up so they can become a little bit more rich and a little bit more powerful yeah as if they need it right <laughs> right right you mentioned you know you, you were talking about your uh little, little comic there which i've seen that one it's brilliant and and you mentioned you've showed it in your church um, folks, uh, didn't catch our last, uh, episode together. You are a pastor. I am. A lot of these culture war issues are framed I in a, in a Christian way, right? We've got this big Christian nationalism push. Project 2025 is, is a, an inherently like Christian nationalist document. Uh, we've got... Uh, lieutenant governor candidate in this state who is uh, openly an avowed Christian nationalist and yeah. uh, talks about it a lot. You're a pastor. Yep. You do not share these values. I like, do. How does how does this whole thing make you feel? Um, some mixture of both disgusted and enraged. Um, disgusted because... It, it is such a perversion of what I understand the gospel and the message of Jesus and the role of Christianity to be. Um, I, I just, when I, when I read scripture, I absolutely do not come away with this idea that we ought to be trying to conquer uh, the nation through force and imposing, you know, Christianity as the primary religion on people. Um, that that's not the way 
that Jesus went about doing it. As a matter of fact, as I in my reading of it, that was a a path that he specifically rejected uh, when some of his followers had hoped that he would do that. He said, "This isn't the way that we do it." it, it you know, he talks about a message of, um, you know, the first shall be last, and and we we lead through service and love and self sacrifice, not you know through through power and dominion, right? So I feel like Christian nationalism is a clear violation of Jesus's own message and mission. Um, and I say enraged because I, they're taking something that is deeply personal, meaningful to me and beautiful to me. And I feel like they're corrupting it. And, um, in a way that I, I reject, but I also don't want to let them have it. Right. I don't, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to say, you know, I don't want to give them the, um, the satisfaction of getting to claim Christianity or, or Jesus, especially for something that I find so, so offensive. Um, and so it, it, it's one of the reasons why I'm doing this. And I wanted folks, uh, you know, other Christians who didn't share those views to, to see somebody else prominently who also doesn't share those views. So they don't feel alone. Um, but also people from the outside looking in to say, okay, at least there are some expressions of Christianity that are not this, this vile dominating thing that I'm seeing in these other places. Um, so that if somebody is potentially exploring or whatever, they can say, okay, like I- at least that's not the case for everybody. And there are, there are other expressions that I might find, um, more palatable or, or more acceptable. Is this something that you get into while you're canvassing and people are talking to, I am sure you get probably some of the Christian nationalist talking points come back at you. Um, I've got to assume you're in a position where you can shoot that down better than most folks. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, honestly, I get more of it from, um, folks on the, on the liberal side who are concerned about it. So they see pastor and they're like, whoa. And so, um, which I totally understand, right? I, I, I absolutely 100% get somebody who is going to see that and say, hold on a second. You're not like that right and then give he gives me an opportunity to say no i'm not and here's why i'm doing this um but yeah folks on the other side when when some of those issues come up uh it does provide an opportunity and uh, because i've talked about it quite a bit um i've uh, had had a few chances to sit down and have some some conversations with folks but a lot of times at the doors they don't have enough time to sit down and get into a, a nuanced discussion of, of the differences um and i just try to frame it as this is my ability I, i've been trying to serve people um, and help meet their needs as a chaplain and as a pastor. And I'm trying to bring that now to the next level. Um, and I'll talk about how in my work as a pastor and as a chaplain, I came to the realization that that charity will never be sufficient to fix what bad policy creates. Um, and so I'll talk about uh, a, a quote from Desmond Tutu who said, you know, pulling people out of the river is great, but eventually we have to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. And so I'm I'm running for office to sort of do that, to go upstream and find out where people are calling in so that we can prevent that and give everybody a, a greater opportunity, uh, sort of lift everybody up instead of just change the odds for a few folks to chair. That's a, that's a brilliant uh, quote from Desmond Tutu. I had not heard that one. Yeah, Nick, right? It, it really is. It, 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 it speaks to systems, right? Yes. Systemic problems um, and how fixing the big thing upstream can prevent people from falling in because yeah it is it's inefficient to do it that way right 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 yeah it's i mean I, another analogy i use is is it's often a band-aid on a bullet hole uh, i mean one of the examples i use is you know our church uh sponsors a food pantry and every week we are helping hundreds of people uh get a little food for the week but that is not going to solve food insecurity Right. If if they're not able to get jobs that pay living wages enough for them to afford the rising cost of housing and the rising cost of groceries, um, right? What we're doing is good. It's necessary. It's a band aid, and band aids are helpful. But band aids are not a cure. Um, and so we we have to be able to go upstream and find out okay, why are people hungry? Why aren't they able to get jobs? Why are things so expensive? Uh, and that is when I talk about the difference between charity and justice, um, those are the kinds of things that I try to educate my own, my own folks about in church. There's, there's charity and we're always going to need charity, right? That we're never going to totally eliminate that, but it's also never going to fix injustice, right? <laughs> injustice is fixed through, through fixing systems and structures and policies. 
Um, and that should hopefully reduce the need for charity, but it will never eliminate it. And then we can have charity to, you know, to catch the folks that, that are still falling in for whatever reason. Um, but we need, we need higher level, systemic level, structural level, policy level changes to, to make that better for everybody. I was talking to uh, Cindy Worth recently over in uh, Congressional District 6 here yeah. in Indiana, and, and her opponent is Jefferson Shreve, who is like independently extremely wealthy. He's worth you know, probably like $600 million. And one of the things I, I, I've written about him previously is, you know, he, he claims to be this great philanthropist, right? He, he's all about charity. But relying on that the charity, especially that, like, billionaire philanthropy, right? Yet you have to go through all of the exploitation and the poor systems to get these folks that rich in the first place to then rely on their philanthropy. Right. Right. And and one of the things that I think that we don't often talk about in those spaces is the, the temptation in those spaces to develop a savior complex, right? I think sometimes mm -hmm. there becomes a resistance to fixing things at a higher level because then, well, what will my charity do, you know, if we fix these problems at a higher level? <laughs> um, you know, and so I think that- How can I take credit for fixing the problem that I myself caused? <laughs> right, right. And, and again, I, I'm not knocking charity because well, there's always gonna be a need for it and, and folks benefit from it. Um, but it has to be, you know, secondary to addressing the reasons why people are falling in the river. I, I just, I think that illustration captures it so clearly. In your space, especially talking about members of the congregation, you know, people who are probably, you know, just holding on themselves, helping people who aren't holding on, right? You know, we're not talking about billionaires here. We're talking about, you know, just community and regular people helping each other that's 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 not philanthropy so much as mutual aid right exactly exactly right yeah 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 i mean and i, I am grateful every time you know uh, i mean i'm grateful for billionaire philanthropy um but also i want to work towards a world where it, it is less necessary because we've addressed the systems that make it necessary it's like, oh, you guys want to help? Thanks. How about you pay your taxes? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, so speaking of uh, things financed by taxes, um, public education has been one of the big topics here in Indiana uh, as well. Um, and I was watching this debate with Mike Braun and Jennifer McCormick last night, and that was one of the big things, big things they argued about. Um, and she hit Braun over vouchers right vouchers right. are in essence defunding public schools do i read that correctly in, in a sense yeah um so the the way that it works currently is our the vouchers come off the top of of the education budget right um and so the um the indiana coalition of public education um, has some some really great resources um, for this. What they they sort of refer to it as a as a leaky bucket. So the state general fund pours money into education in general, but right off the top comes um, uh, like the the vouchers, the choice scholarships, the the charter schools, and all of that. And then traditional public schools sort of get what's left over at the end. And what has happened over the past several cycles is we have expanded and expanded and expanded this voucher program. So what was initially touted as this way to rescue poor kids from failing schools and give them a choice to succeed somewhere else um, has become uh, really just subsidizing the rich who have already been sending their kids to public school and now we're just paying for it. And the school districts are are sort of bearing the brunt of that cost. Uh, and so Dr. Phil Downs, uh, who is a former superintendent of an Allen County area um, and ICPE have these tools where you can go and you can look by county um, at how much uh, each school district share of uh, the voucher program they show. And so to give you a 
clear example. District 62 includes all of Brown County. Uh, now, Brown County has zero private schools. However, their share of the voucher program uh, in the 2023-2024 school year was $761,000, right? So that is money that they would have received had we not expanded the voucher program to include um, you know, families who are making so much money. So sc local school districts are actually losing money they would receive from the budget as we subsidize uh, children going to private schools in other counties, you know, Allen County and Marion County. And the, the kids that we're subsidizing more and more, we're realizing, are not kids who were once in failing public schools, but these are kids who have always been going to private school. Their parents have been paying for it, and now we're just subsidizing it. Uh, and on top of that, these are schools that have zero accountability. They don't need to account to the state for outcomes. They don't need to account to the state for how they uh, spend the money. And they're allowed to discriminate based on whatever they want because they're private schools, religious schools. Um, so yes, we essentially we are uh, we are subsidizing wealthy families, sending their kids to private schools that are allowed to discriminate at the cost to local uh, public school systems. Right, and those those local school systems are like mandated by law to have to cover a lot of things that these private and charter schools don't have to do. Like the private charter schools don't have to take every special needs kid in the county or in their school district and care for them, right? And those those kids are you know, disproportionately expensive to care for, which is great. That's fine. You know, we should do this. This is a, you know, a community obligation, but... Right. Those private and charter schools don't have that same thing. Same thing with like transportation and 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 busing. Like that's a huge chunk of a lot of school budgets. Is is just transportation. Exactly. Exactly. And then on top of that, I I don't have the exact numbers in front of me right now, so uh, forgive if it's a little inaccurate here. But I believe it was three. Uh, three different charter schools in the last couple of years that have um, now come under indictment for fraud, right? So they're, they're taking this money. Um, and if I remember correctly, they, they were, um, they were fraudulently inflating their numbers. So they would, so they would get more money and they, they didn't actually have the number of students that they claimed that they had. Uh, and again, so this is money that, that could have been in traditional public schools uh, that folks have figured out that they can, you know, just, claim that they have the school and there's again there's very few requirements there's there's very little accountability um that the people who are getting this public money have to uh be accountable for um, they don't have to answer for it uh and in, in some cases it, it ends up be being actual criminal fraud and i tell you i'm i'm a pretty peaceful guy i'm not <laughs> vengeful i believe in restorative justice right but those folks allegedly are ripping off children right uh, yeah i want to throw more than the book at them right right yeah yes they're ripping off our children and uh, you know then at the same time, they want to they want to complain about you know the cost of things like welfare and food stamps and all the stuff when we know that every dollar invested in early childhood education in the education in general uh, is is going to pay off in the long run in terms of well educated citizens who uh, who get jobs and pay taxes right so if you if you want to stop. Like if you want to address some of these problems, we know that investing in education is going to do that. Um, so it's it's sort of you you defund the programs that are uh, going to prevent the kinds of problems that you're complaining about. Um, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's it it's a mess all around. Yeah, the schools and, and even the welfare and the public assistance and all that stuff. And I feel like Republicans all too often they just they only look at it as a cost like a sunk cost and not as an investment in your people that's correct like if your people are educated 
They're going to be more productive in the future. They're going to be more innovative. Uh, if people are eating and have a food and have a roof over their head, they're going to be be more productive citizens. Right, right. That's exactly right. Um, and all of that is is borne out by the data. Um, so it's again, it just it's it's getting that message out and, and helping people understand that that's the reality, and and then pulling back the curtain, right? Uh, with the stuff we talked about earlier, and here's why these culture war things are, are really just a distraction from these other things. Um, you know, when it comes to these vouchers, there were folks who were telling us at the very beginning that they knew that the vouchers wasn't actually about rescuing, you know, more mm -hmm. kids from failing schools. It, it has always been a Trojan horse to privatize uh, education yeah. for, for culture war issues. So um, I think just pulling back the curtain, educating people, letting them know is a big part of the process yeah and, and you know where, where vouchers came from originally right like they where they were invented they uh came directly out of uh the response to brown versus board of education it right these, these were invented like in virginia in the south to 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 find a workaround because the the federal government said no you need to integrate your schools and and you know the white supremacists in the south were like all right how are we going to take public money and, and use it to send our white kids to school by themselves and and that is the, the the lineage of vouchers yep yep and they may have shined them up really good but they kind of still do the same thing yes yeah I and mean, that's exactly right that's exactly right most of the folks who are getting these now are wealthy white folks um, who were already going to private schools to begin with. Yeah, it's disgusting. Yeah. So I was looking at your website a little bit before we hopped on here, looking at your campaign issues. And when we've talked about you know, quality of life, right? That's the big thing people talk about at, at your door. And that you know includes the economy, housing, wages, and healthcare. And it, it includes schools. Right. Right? Right. Right. Um, and now and this... this culture war stuff is, is essentially used to distract from the Republicans decreasing our quality of life. Right. Um, and so we've talked about those three, but um, you also talk a lot about the environment on, on, on your website. And, and again, you know, quality of life, right? Quality right, of right. Our, our environment, our, 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 our living area. So what... Right. Um, what is the biggest component of the environmental issue that 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 you see as a a uh, problem that we need to address in any of this? I mean, it's it's so interconnected. Um, but just by way of example, we we know that Indiana has the most polluted waterways in the country. Um, you know, most of our lakes and streams are are not safe for fishing, uh, for swimming. They're not. Uh, we have we have folks who some folks who are relying on you know the fish in their for sustenance, right? Um, and so I think it's we we have to address the the issues of of runoff into our our lakes and streams. Um, some of which is agricultural, some of which is human from failing septics, uh, some of which is um, our utility companies, which are still, you know, relying very heavily on uh, fossil fuels instead of transitioning to cleaner, more sustainable energies. Um, and so I, I think it's sort of a holistic, I think we, what I would like to see is, you know, some sort of environmental task force that evaluates the environmental aspect of, of perhaps any piece of legislation, right? We know that there's there's fiscal notes. Every piece of legislation has a fiscal note. Here's what it will cost financially to to implement this. I think it would be would be neat if we incorporated some sort of like environmental or or climate note to this. Here will be the the environmental impact of such and such policy, um, and, and who will be affected by that. Um, and then in whatever ways we incentivize uh, folks. Now, we we got to be careful with that, right? Because um, sometimes we can go the wrong direction with environmental stuff. And then folks who are already um, low wage, low income, end up bearing a greater cost 
So there's got to be ways that we can help those folks while holding, you know, the people who do have the resources, some of these major corporations who are contributing to so much of the pollution, uh, accountable for cleanup. Um, and I'll give a negative example that happened in the last legislative session, which was um, one of our major energy companies. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that they were not allowed to pass on the cost of their cleanup to ratepayers. They, they, they. Supreme Court uh, regarded that as retroactive rate making, right? And said, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, so our uh, our state legislature then, um, the and my opponent, who sits on the utilities um, committee as vice chair, uh, they rushed through an amendment to a bill overriding the Supreme Court saying, actually, they can pass on the cost of their cleanup to ratepayers, right? So it's really, really inter interconnected. <laughs> right. No, it um, makes you want to grind a little. Yeah. <laughs> Although we, 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 we repudiate violence, we don't actually want to strangle them. We just want to vote them out. Well, we can, we can want to strangle them. <laughs> we just don't actually do it. Uh, that's, that's so gross. If you say, well, you know, uh, you're talking about who's contributing to the environmental problem, right? And, right. and it is those, those big corporations, your, your Dukes and your center points and your Nipscos and who, you know, whoever else, I'm sure there's other energy utilities in the uh, in state, but those are the ones I know. Um, in addition to contributing to the environmental problems, they're also contributing to the Republican legislators, right? Who are covering up their environmental problems. That's exactly right. That's exactly And that's especially gross. Um, you mentioned your opponent. Uh, that is the incumbent Dave Hall. He won his race two years ago by a couple hundred votes. It less was than that. Much. Less than that. Less it was, than that. It was 37, and they went to a recount, and the total ended up being 73. So it was 73 votes in, at the end. 73 votes. So 73 votes. Th this was the closest race in the state two years ago, right? That's correct. And it is targeted as the closest race this year as well. Say understandably. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. So <laughs> I see maybe at first he wasn't taking this race as seriously, but I'm seeing a whole lot of Dave Hall uh, the last month or so. Uh, he's bringing in the big signs, bringing in the bringing in the SUV. You know, got a got a lot of stuff going up all over the place. He's got the uh, bottomless pockets of the Republican supermajority behind him. How do you overcome that? Yeah. So we we just need people to turn out, which has been our goal. So. Um, one of the most recent models I've seen uh, has this district is actually D plus three. One of the things that we know from the 2022 race was turnout in some of our strongest areas was abysmally low. Um, so we overcome that uh, in by getting out um, and knocking on as many doors as we possibly can, um, by raising as much money as we possibly can so that we can get our own message out there. Um, and folks will be pleased to know we've already had uh, three mailers go out uh, and hit the mailboxes. Uh, we've got uh, one uh, commercial on TV um, right now in, in cable and digital spaces. Um, and if if folks want to help us with that, right, to help us stay on the air and, and keep these things coming out, fi contributing financially, um, you know, I don't think we'll ever be able to completely compete with, with the Republican unlimited cash machine. Um, but folks who have contributed to us have allowed us to um, get some of these things out into people's mailboxes, especially in such a, a geographically sprawled district. Um, and then it's just the, the good old fashioned, you know, um, hard work. So helping us uh, get out, knock doors and write postcards, um, do phone banking. Um, and I'm, I'm feeling pretty encouraged with that. And so if, if, you know, any of your folks are, you know, Viewers and listeners want to get involved. Um, if you're in the area, uh, go to our website and sign up to knock doors with us. 
Uh, it's really a lot of fun. If you've never done it, it's actually one of my favorite parts of campaigning is, is talking to people at their doors. It's not as scary as it sounds at all. Um, and if you're not comfortable with that, uh, we've got phone banking options or postcard writing options where you can connect with voters uh, that way. Um, and we'll provide training for all of these. And if you don't have the access to that or you don't live in the area, but you have a little extra finance and you want to want to chip in to help us get some more mail out and help us stay on the air and print some some big <laughs> some bigger signs uh, to to get some name rack, um, you know, we'll certainly put those contributions to good use. Yeah, and that's that's really important because, um, you know, there's there's lots of parts in the state and Democrats in Indiana have been doing a lot better about contesting every race. But there are still. Plenty of places in the state where there isn't a Democrat on the ballot. Maybe you're in one of those places where you don't have anybody to help directly. Well, you know, someone like Thomas or, um, you know, Matt McNally in, in Carmel or Josh Lowry up in Westfield or, you know, some lots of these other folks I've, I've talked to uh, over the course of this election cycle that are in flippable races. That's right. They need your help because breaking the supermajority helps the whole state. That's exactly right. I, I, what I hope your viewers have already gathered from your other conversations is that that is that is within reach this cycle. Uh, we have enough competitive races that if we get enough support to get our message out, it is and with the momentum at the top of the ticket and and people's um, dissatisfaction with the status quo, it is within reach to break the supermajority in this cycle. And what I've been saying as I go around is is that's not the end. That's just the beginning, right? Because if we can flip these seats this cycle. Um, and and bring supermajority, do some good work, and then in 2026, if we can uh, protect and flip a few more, and 2028 protect and flip a few more, we get to 2030, right? And and perhaps we have a say in, in drawing some fairer lines, so that uh, the the real political makeup of Indiana could be reflected in our in our legislature. Um, we know based on polling that uh, you know 42 percent of um, Hoosiers identify as Democrats, that is not reflected in the state house, right? So this is the result of gerrymandering. And it's also the result of the fact that we are 50th in the nation for voter engagement and voter turnout. This is the other thing too. We will win a lot more races if we just get out and vote. But I think yeah. too many folks have gotten um, complacent or, or they've bought the lie that their vote doesn't matter because we're hopelessly Republican, but we're not. Um, and if folks actually get out and vote, right, we will see some some major turnaround. And if we can sustain that for for a few cycles, we do have a real shot in redrawing some fairer lines. And I don't think that that's just a pipe dream because it's happened to places like Michigan and Wisconsin, right? Um, Long term strategy uh, has paid off. So folks who, as you said, in other parts of the state, who will invest in this race now, so that over the next few cycles we can invest in expanding. Um, you know, I, we just we got to do a better job thinking long term and, and strategizing um, and recognizing that uh, our our involvement really does matter. Right. If, if we're 50th in voter turnout and we're yeah. very red, it, it just means that the ones who aren't showing up right, are, are us. It's a vicious cycle, right? You yeah. know, you, you, you get. They put the Republicans put the voter ID in place, I want to say like 2008, 2009. Um, and immediately, the next election cycle had an effect on voter turnout. They right. went in 2010, they draw the districts, they gerrymandered the districts, so it's it's harder to, 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 to vote your way into power anyway. So, right. okay, well now you're gerrymandered, it's like, well, what the hell's the point? We can't vote our way out of this. So it just, it just, you know, it, it, it's a self-reinforcing system. I think that if Democrats can win the presidency and both houses of Congress this year, which is it's a big lift, but if they can, they get uh, for the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act through, those things will help places yeah. like Indiana, yeah. where maybe we're a little further behind Michigan or Wisconsin in terms of, you know, uh, you know, making things fair. We can get a little help from the feds. Then we're looking at outlawing gerrymandering. So come 2030, yeah, we'll yeah. have fair yeah. districts. And then, right. and then we can see our values reflected in our state legislature. Right, right. That's, that's correct. 
And I think part of this messaging too needs to be that even for Republicans, the the supermajority is out of touch and extreme, even for most Indiana Republicans. And we know this with, when it comes to things like the abortion ban, when it comes to things like the legalization of cannabis, um, you know, when it comes to things like public education and vouchers, um, like the. So, and I've been telling Republicans, listen, if you if you vote for me, this cycle it doesn't make you a Democrat for life, right? You 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 can still be a Republican, but you can recognize that the supermajority is is bad for you too, right? Um, that it's affecting your bottom line as well, um, you know. And later on, and things are a little bit more balanced, you, you you can go back to being a Republican if you want to be go back to being a Republican, right? But for now, we all sort of have to band together uh, to create a, a government that that's working for all of us um, instead of that's so out of touch with our needs and our values. And and I'll tell you again, I'm I'm a I'm a lefty. I'm a left lefty. Uh, but this ticket in Indiana this year, you've got Jennifer McCormick, a former Republican. You've got Terry Gooden, uh, for lieutenant and governor. You know he's a real good old boy. I talk to him. Uh, he, nicest guy you ever want to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then Thomas, you. You are a pastor. How are the, you know, you, you can't, they can't out-Christian you. <laughs> That's right. So I think Republicans from, you know, moderate to even, like, you know, conservative but not out there, th there I don't think there's any reason you can't safely vote Democratic for those races in right. this cycle. Right. Yeah, and, and there's, you know, even if I was the most e e extreme left, you know, sort of candidate, and I'm not, but even if I was, um, the idea that simply me winning would would make the legislature extreme, like there's there's just no chance of that, right? We're just trying to bring, we're just trying to bring some balance back <laughs> right now. We're just trying to bring some accountability back. Uh, we're just trying to to make things a little bit more fair because that's all that we have the chance to do. There's there's no chance that this cycle we are going to all of a sudden be in the majority, let alone a super majority. We just think there ought to be, you know, some more accountability and s some more balance. So you're absolutely right. Like, it's not like voting for, for any of us on this, on this ticket is going to turn Indiana into some, you know, left-wing socialist. Yeah, California. You know, yeah. Utopia. Exactly. Right. There, there's just, there's simply no chance of that. Um, but we do have a chance to bring back some balance and to work for a government that works for the actual people instead of just being distracted by culture wars and protecting corporate profits. Yeah. So, uh, Tom, we're coming up on the end here. We've only got a couple minutes left. So in that time, I want to give you an opportunity to you know, give people your, your sort of closing pitch and then um, tell folks where they can help you out. I know you've already said, uh, you know, we need some phone banking and postcard writing and canvassing help. Give them the website, too. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Horrocks for Hoosiers dot com. That's H O R R O C K S F O R Hoosiers dot com. Uh, you can donate there. You can sign up uh, to host a yard sign or canvas or phone bank. Um, and then on top of that, my encouragement is just get out and vote. Uh, um, you know, 50th in the nation for voter engagement. You have an opportunity right here in District 62 uh, in many other districts across the state. Um, if if we turn out. Uh, I think this, I, I know this is true for, for District 62. If we turn out, we're going to win here. Um, I believe that's true, you know, for, for McNally and for Lowry. I, I even believe that's true for uh, Destiny Wells and Jennifer McCormick this cycle. The the numbers are, are looking like we we could do this. Um, so this is not this is not the year um, to, to protest by not showing up. Um, this is the year to, to get out and vote for the best option that you have on the ticket to bring some some balance back to the state house, and if we work together, we've got a chance uh, to to bring the focus back to the people who need it the most. Excellent. Well, Thomas, I appreciate you doing doing the good work out there and doing your best to to bring real Hoosier values to Indianapolis. And uh, I, I, you know, I want to thank you again for being here with me today. Well, thank you for all that you do to to help get the message out and for taking the time this morning. All right, everybody. Thomas Horrocks, thank you very much. Thank you. Once again, that was Thomas Horrocks, Democratic candidate for State House of Representatives, District 62, 
which includes all of Brown and parts of Monroe and Jackson counties in south-central Indiana. So over the last few months, I've spoken with several scholars of religion. Andrew Whitehead, Matthew Taylor, Karen Park, and now this is my second interview with Pastor Thomas. So, let's see if this heathen here has learned anything and begin my closing thoughts by turning to Scripture. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, let's bring in a little math and apply the transitive property. If, according to Timothy 3.16, Jesus is God in human flesh, then you cannot serve both Jesus and money. Let's go a step further. In Matthew 25, Jesus says, Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. Again, by the transitive property, then you cannot serve both the least among us and money. And I'll be damned if that isn't basically the same thing you'll find in the Gospel of Pepper, Book 1, Chapter 5. Quote, Serving private interests earns you far greater rewards than the public interest. And, as a politician in a ring district, the biggest risk you face is being outflanked by an extremist in your next primary. So your incentive is to be as extreme as possible. Even if public outcomes plummet, so long as you are extreme and cater to those private interests, you and your colleagues are re-elected. No sweat. And the one thing that will get you ousted from office? Working with the other party on anything. So never do that. End quote. Horrocks said... 95% of his interactions with voters concerned the economy. Dave Hall and the Republican supermajority make sure Indiana's economy works for their donors, not for the least of these among us. Tom brought up the quote by Desmond Tutu about challenging systems. Dave Hall and the Republican supermajority ensure that downstream problems go unsolved if a donor profits upstream. Who among us are more vulnerable than children? Dave Hall and the Republican supermajority drain the funds earmarked for those children's public schools and funnel them to their donors in the for-profit education industry and ideologues in the religious indoctrination industry. Indiana's waterways are the dirtiest in the nation, and our air quality is almost as bad. Dave Hall and the Republican supermajority let our monopoly energy companies pollute with impunity and run an end around on the very conservative state Supreme Court to force consumers to pay for the cleanup. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both ordinary Hoosiers and money interests. Dave Hall and the Republican supermajority serve their wealthy benefactors. Thomas Horrocks will serve us. Thank you for listening. Find out more about Tom's campaign at Horrocks for Hoosiers. That's H O R R O C K S for spelled out F O R Hoosiers. Volunteer, donate, help however you can. Links are in the show notes. 
And if you are listening to this on the day of publication, today is the last day to register to vote in Indiana. So pause, do so right now if you haven't, and double check your registration even if you have. Make sure your family and friends have also taken these steps. Then, early voting opens tomorrow. Use it. Vote as early as possible and dedicate the rest of the time before Election Day making sure others vote. Tell everyone you know. Finally, if you're feeling extra generous after you've contributed to the Horrocks campaign, head on over to scottaaronrogers.substack.com and help support this project with a paid subscription. That's where you'll find everything I publish, but you can also find me on Facebook, Blue Sky, YouTube, and TikTok at Who's Left, and on most other social media sites at ScottRogers78. My DMs are open for feedback, tips, ideas, and concerns. You can also email me at scottrogers78 at gmail.com. Forward the show to a friend and have them forward it to another friend. Let's keep building this project and a more democratic Indiana. Until next time, this has been the Who's Left Podcast. Scott Aaron Rogers. Love each other, Indiana.